Right, thank you very much. Uh, hello everybody and thank you for the opportunity to speak at this session. It's something that's been a hobby interest of mine and also thanks to all the preceding papers that have given me a lot of very interesting ideas of what else I can do with the data set that I'm about to present. Uh, I want to talk about Ireland, the island of Ireland and its archaeological uh, data set on that. Now, Ireland has got a, a fairly rich um, prehistoric and early medieval heritage. We have hundreds of thousands of archaeological sites, all of which are well documented in sites and monuments records. And also, uniquely, the Republic of Ireland uh, over the last 20 years has undergone a economic transformation, which has led to a lot of infrastructural development. The motorways in the Republic of Ireland have only been built really in the last 15 years, and they were fully monitored by archaeologists. And so that uh, wealth of fieldwork, and it really is an absolute data mountain, is one of the things that makes Ireland particularly well disposed to looking at questions of negative evidence and negative, uh, you know, what, what that tells us. And the other thing that makes Ireland particularly well suited for this kind of work is in the 1960s, a group of uh, archaeology students from Belfast decided to set up an annual excavations bulletin. Now, every excavation that happens in Ireland has to be licensed. It is uh, illegal to go and dig without getting an excavation license from the, from the government department. It's not like that you know, in Britain, for example. And uh, as part of the requirements for that license, the director of the excavation has to produce, at the end of the year, a summary report, just a few paragraphs, that is then sent to a centralized resource. And all this data has been available on the internet now for about 20 years on excavations.ie uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, the Department of the Culture um, uh, in the Republic of Ireland actually funds it. And it contains the summaries of 22,000 or the ever-growing number of excavations that have been undertaken you know, since 1969. So this is a huge data set and that is a, a map of where they all exist in the landscape. And uh, I was looking at this uh, data set one day to try to work out, right, let's get where all the settlement sites are, and we can compare that to uh, where all the, you know, all the megalithic remains are, and let's see if there's a difference in the landscape. And because it was never really designed for any sort of uh, database-style querying, this data set is quite messy. It has uh, got an unstructured ontology. Um, lots of similar sites are called different things, and it's very difficult to go into it and just extract out uh, any particular site category without really a lot of heavyweight work going through it all. But the by far the most, there's five, over 5,000 different site types. Uh, uh, but by far the most frequent one is the sites that are of no archaeological significance. And when I saw this, I thought it would be very, very interesting just to compare where these sites are in the landscape, what sort of places they constitute, and compare that to all the sites where we do have archaeology. And you know, that simple binary presence or absence. It's not an opportunity we have in very many other or any other major uh, jurisdictions, I don't think. So uh, that's what I did. There's a map of where the archaeology has been found in sites in Ireland, and another map of where the archaeology has not been found in sites in Ireland. And you can see in the first instance that it already has got uh, a few interesting features. Great, I thought, I'll start to look at. Uh, the actual parameters of this landscape and see what exactly is driving this. So, uh, cracking out the GIS, uh, loading up a digital elevation model, and just looked at the looked at the uh, distribution of, of these sites in the landscape. And significantly, there's many more sites where archaeology was found, you know, between sort of zero and twenty-five meters above sea level. And that's really the only difference in the two data sets. The, the rest has just been driven by commonalities in the, in the land border. Uh, so you can compare this statistically both to themselves and to just random samples of the digital elevation model and see what comes out as significant. So that's very encouraging. It seems that the elevation is a, uh, is a, is a you know, risk factor for, for finding archaeology on these sites. And the question, of course, is why these particular elevations? And I'll come back to that. Today in Ireland, uh, nobody lives or farms above 150 metres above sea level. And that's the main uh, feature of the data. So slope, how steep the ground is. Uh, is there any archaeological significance to that? 
Well, seemingly not. Uh, sites are uh, are fairly randomly. Uh, well, the landform itself has got a certain average shape, and there's no real difference in where archaeology is found or not found. Uh, there's no preference for very flat sites, for example, which is interesting. Aspect. So the 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 outlook from the site, the angle on which the the site's terrain is pointed. Now, for sites where archaeology archaeology has been found, you see that. The cardinal directions, you know, north, east, south, west, come out as really quite significant. There's a significant number of sites that point in that direction. And if you were to do that to a group of archaeological sites, you'd probably think, wow, look at the cos cosmological <laughs> significance of these uh, uh, you know, coordinates. Um, but in actual fact, when you look at the sites where archaeology was not found, you see a very similar pattern. And this is because sites where archaeology has not been found, these are development sites. So in a thousand years' time, these are going to become archaeological sites. Yes. And the cosmological significance of that uh, uh, is, is something that persists throughout the generations. So that is quite interesting. And there are actually significant uh, effects here. I mean, it's, it's obvious that people like uh, you know, a southern outlook, for example, but that's, that's not earth shattering news. You know. uh, distance to known monuments. Now, this is something that the uh, regulatory authorities who arbitrate archaeology and planning and things like that would be interested in. It's often their condition that if a site is near a known monument, it, it needs to be uh, more uh, thoroughly investigated or more um, adequately tested before development is given the go-ahead. And so uh, this is the probability distribution reconstructed using kernel density of where archaeology was found and where archaeology wasn't found compared to just random samples of the landscape that they get out. You know, any random points. And there's actually no real difference between where archaeology was found and where archaeology wasn't found with respect to distance to known monuments, which is quite interesting. They're both significantly different from random points, but that's because people are made to look near. You know, this part of the earth here, that's where people are made to actually work. But uh, they may as well have randomized that strategy and found more archaeology as a consequence. Distance to fresh water sources, uh, you know, it's another classic. Uh, to see if uh, that's significant. And uh, although when you look at the actual pattern, um, it's quite interesting in that it seems that sites where archaeology is found, uh, for some reason, there's a lot more of them distant from water sources than uh, just random points in the landscape, which makes little sense, you know. Uh, and I can't really interpret that, but when you do the statistics, uh, it just could be a, just a random chance of the stochasticity of the, of the data itself. So, uh, soils, uh, which is another interesting one. Uh, just looking at broad categories of soil, how well drained it is, how poorly drained it is. Uh, if it's on uh, alluvial floodplains, uh, peat bogs, which are very, very five or six percent, uh, I think, of uh, the land surface in Ireland is, is peat bog. Uh, just, you know, what actually comes up. And to do, it looks quite significant when you first do it, but you realize that what's driving this difference is sites in urban areas, which are obviously on you know, made ground. And when you take that away, there's no real difference in uh, sites, whether they're in well-drained ground or not so well-drained ground. The only difference really is peat. Uh, peat is extremely good at preserving archaeological remains, you know, timber in particular, because of its water law of nature. And uh, so where we look in peat bogs, we find archaeology at a much higher rate than uh, uh, on average. And the kind of sites that we find in peat bogs are trackways, places that connect one part of the landscape to another and traverse this, this, uh, this sort of track, that, you know, actually get from one part of the landscape to another. So this uh, brings us to mind of the fact that you know, you, this entire approach to archaeology really is about trying to reconstruct these networks and these paths and these movements across the landscape. And so this is what it all boils down to. Networks are essentially the thing that are driving the, uh, the change. Now, I haven't really done any fancy statistical modeling in this, but you can see uh, where archaeology is found, the pattern of modern roads comes up much more strongly than it does in sites where archaeology has not been found. And, you know, this is perhaps due to the high quality archaeological services that are, uh, you know, 
very carefully managed and controlled by things like the National Roads Authority in the Republic of Ireland. But it's also to do with the fact that roads are simply not independent of the, of the archaeological past, nor are they independent of the parameters of the, that the landscape and the landform gives us that allows us to traverse this, uh, this landform. And to illustrate it, when we look at the, what's known about the pattern of early medieval uh, roads in Ireland, in fact, these probably date back to the Iron Age, uh, they sort of follow you know, you know, this, this road here, this road here, this road here. They're the same pathways through the landscape. And uh, the, when we look, my colleague Emma Hanna in Queens has been looking at the, you know, the least cost path, the uh, correlations between these, these roads and just you know, deriving that from the elevation model and shows that it's basically the same thing. So this illustrates that those sites, those elevations, you know, that nicely significant uh, uh, histogram where we have sites that are you know, 20 meters above sea level or so that come up as part of uh, arche ar where archaeology is found more frequently. That's not because of any particularly advantageous uh, reason why that landscape is more suited for agriculture or settlement, but it is because it's more suited for traversing the landform itself. And because these sites are part of the network, there's a lower cost associated with getting to them and getting from them. Right, well, that's me. Uh, to conclude, <laughs> uh, the, many of the correlations between the archaeology and no archaeology and the landform itself do seem significant. But what the no visible remains or the, where we haven't found archaeology allows us to do uniquely is uh, this wonderful control sample that you would need if you were conducting a, a medical trial, for, to use Tim's you know, analogy from earlier. Uh, and uh, the fact that modern development patterns dominate these signals is of course what we would expect. It's the systematic bias in archaeology, but that is not independent of the reasons why people did the things that they were in the past anyway. So thank you very much. <laughs>